Hello and welcome to another edition of ISG Smart Talks, the podcast where we try to educate, to inform and to entertain our listeners about the latest happenings in the world of technology and its impact on business. So I am Barry Matthews and my guest today, I'm delighted to say, is Stanton Jones, who is Director and Principal Analyst at ISG. As always, Stanton, I try and introducing my interviewees and then I give up and say it's probably much better if you just introduce yourself. So you and I have known each other for a while, but I'm, I would do a terrible job at introducing you. So please introduce yourself. Sure. Thanks, Barry. Great to be on the podcast. So my name is Stanton Jones. As you said, I'm a director and principal analyst at ISG. I've been at ISG for almost two decades now, have held multiple roles from advisory roles to a stint as the uh, as the CIO and, and now in our research business, uh, building out our uh, enterprise and service provider research capability. So thr- thrilled to be on the podcast. Thanks. Excellent. No, and delighted to, to have you with us today. So one of the things I wanted to, to talk to you about is you have such a, a breadth of experience in just about everything that, that we do at ISG, but you're now very firmly in the research field. Um, one of the things that differentiates ISG is that we are both a research and an advisory firm. So we we carry out analysis on the industry and, and what's what's happening in the industry and what changes are happening in, in technology generally. And then we take that data, we give, put it in the hands of our advisors and they help our, the, our clients to achieve their objectives to, using that combination of both research and data and advice. Now, you've been heavily involved in what we call the ISG index. So for a long period of time now, I think the last 67 quarters, we've been tracking the sourcing industry. And every quarter we publish uh, the sourcing index, an index of the global sourcing deals um, that have happened. So we have a really, really rich repository of data, which we can we can call upon. And I know certainly the advisors I work with, we, we use that day in and day out with our clients. Now, can you t- tell us a little bit about the ISG index and how it works and maybe how it started and what type of deals we, we track and what type of data that we have? Sure, happy to. So you're right, it's 67 consecutive quarters that we've been doing the Global ISG index at 17 years uh, have never missed a quarter, so um, pretty amazing run of you know continually tracking this market, which as you know has changed dramatically over the past uh, couple of decades. So, so broadly, the index tracks um, two types of of contracts. Um, that said, there's there's sort of a floor here. We, we're generally tracking contracts with an ACV of. Uh, more than five million annually, but broadly we look at two sections of the market. One is what we call managed services. So we actually used to call this until fairly recently traditional sourcing. So we just changed that to managed services. And so those are the the more kind of traditional arrangements that we see with our clients around engaging a managed service provider for a managed services uh, uh, relationship. And that relationship, as we'll talk about probably here pretty soon, uh, gets shorter and shorter every year. The other uh, basket that we look at on the index is what we call the as a service market. So these are primarily technology vendors. So if you think about companies like Microsoft or Amazon Web Services or Salesforce or Workday, that makes up that basket of companies. And and as we all know, that market's growing really, really quickly. So we combine both of those together and um, through the index are able to give, we think, a really unique perspective on the broader IT services market, which is well over a, you know, a trillion dollars in combined revenue now. Um, and we consistently get feedback from our clients and service providers and equity analysts who join the call that you know, we have a really unique practical insight into the market because of our unique role. So um, you know, let's, uh, let's hope that we can make it to 100 consecutive quarters for the index. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And and who dials in and listens to the index every every quarter? Is it is it the service provider community? Is it client organizations? Is it analysts? Who who makes up the community who who follow us? Yeah, so it's actually all three. Um, all three really have a vested interest in in the in the index. Service providers want to understand what's happening in the market. We also um, highlight a number of managed service providers and technology vendors each quarter um, a, a, along our building and breakthrough list. So we uh, look at the total ACV of various service providers and technology vendors and talk about where they 
stack up against each other. Um, clients are uh, and enterprise leaders are interested in this data because it gives them a really good picture about what's happening across the, as I said, over you know $1.2 trillion IT services market. And then equity analysts who represent institutional investors also um, come to our call because um, the feedback we get is that it's really one of the best practical insights that they can get into the market because they're covering uh, many of these providers for their institutional investors. So um, last time we had close to 550 people on the call um, and uh, we hope that number continues to grow and, and we think it will over uh, the coming years. Wow. And I know that we have we've captured an awful lot of data in that in that 17 years and those 67 consecutive um, index calls and the research, of course, that goes into the index call. So we've amassed a huge amount of data on the industry. And if you take a step back and you look at the the changes that certainly I've experienced working as a consultant in that in that period of time, you know, I, I know that I used to be involved in in mega deals which were worth billions and had you know 10 year contract values and and now if i think of the the work that my consultants are are doing they're much shorter and more flexible and and the digital world has changed things if if you take a step back and look at what's changed in that in that period of time what what are the main changes that you see can you sort of segment it up in in any way sure yeah this is actually something that we talked about on on our last call and we um we sort of came up with this idea of generations in, in our market and identified three primary generations. So generation one, two, and three. Um, and we've seen some really profound changes over the past couple of decades. So if you think back to, as you just mentioned, what we would call generation one deals, the, um, the size of those deals was much larger than today. So on average, the ACV was around 32 million. And the average contract length was was around five years, uh, and that's typically when enterprises engaged one or two, you know, large managed services provider for um, a lot of uh, towers of scope, and that could be data center, it could be applications, it could be infrastructure. Um, so if you look at that kind of generation one deal, that really ultimately their clients were looking to sort of have one throat to choke and they were looking to transfer assets to those managed service providers. Um, and that's where we saw the greatest number of, 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 you mentioned billion dollar deals. So in that generation one construct, we had on average $19 billion, billion dollar deals per year. If you fast forward to 2007, that's really where we kind of delineate between uh, generation one ending and generation two starting, yeah. drop down to 14 billion, uh, 14 billion dollar deals annually. The ACV annual contract value dropped down to around 20 million and then the contract value down to uh, just over four years. And then if you fast forward to today, which is as you just mentioned, much more smaller nimble deals, um, the number of billion dollar deals has been cut in half. So we're now averaging around eight. The ACB has also been cut in half. That's around 15 million. And then the deal sizes are also shorter. So around three years. Um, and obviously the business rationale for engaging service providers has changed dramatically over the past couple of years. You know, in generation one, as I mentioned, it was about asset transfer and taking cost out of a lot of those back office support functions. Yeah. But now, as technology has really become the business, so technology is not an overhead support function, it is the business and it's a strategic yeah. differentiator for clients. Now, the movement is much more towards, you know, how do I build and sustain a product aligned organization using, you know, moving from plan, build, run to agile? Um, and how do I incorporate cloud into my delivery model? I mean, the entire reason for engaging service providers and technology vendors has changed. And we've seen that change, you know, dramatically over the past, um, as I mentioned, three generations. Yeah, ab ab absolutely. And what do, what do you think if, if you fast forward to the next generation? So if we look, do this in five years time and we were to say, or maybe 10 years time and to say maybe there's, there's four phases. What do you think that the fourth phase, the phase that we're, we're going to be moving into soon will look like? Yeah, good question. So I think we're going to continue to see, and this is reflected in the numbers, you know, an explosion in spend with the technology vendors. And that's, you know, primarily the, um, the massive scale cloud providers. So Amazon and Google and, uh, and Microsoft and software as a service providers. 
But at the same time, many managed service providers are also starting to become product companies. So they are becoming technology vendors because they realize that at the end of the day, you know, platforms are really going to be what is going to differentiate them um, and is going to create nonlinear revenue growth, which is really the goal of, of many managed service providers today. So I think you're going to see a lot of movement more towards platform-based technologies that said, um, I still think that there's a massive opportunity for managed service providers to help companies stitch all of this together into something that creates business value. Because one of the things I think many companies are underestimating today is as they, you know, the, the size of these agreements get smaller and smaller and we go to more best in breed, you know, we're sort of getting these point solutions that meet a specific need but tying them together into something that moves the needle on market capitalization or on stock price or, you know, ultimately, you know, thrilling customers with incredible customer experiences, stitching all of those things in together that's something that accomplishes those goals, I think is something that we're still going to need managed services providers to do. And so, therefore, those that are, are really focused on domain expertise, especially around in, you know specific industry verticals and can help companies tie these things all together i think are really going to be set for success so back to your original question you know what will it look like in some ways i think it'll look very similar to today to today a, a large number of managed service providers and technology vendors but i think the role that they play is going to look very different than today yeah it's in, interesting isn't it? it and i know we've been discussing this this recently Global organizations are, of course, very interested in the, the platform plays and they're interested in the, the hyperscale cloud providers, the AWS, Microsoft and, and Google's. Of course they are. But it's it's very difficult for global organizations with really complex operations to to work with those platform providers without having systems integrators also in the mix, managed service providers to deal with the complexity. Um, and so you end up with this sort of hybrid model, right, of traditional players or the managed service um, providers working in combination with those large scale, um, hyperscale cloud providers, because somebody's got to manage all of that um, complexity. And there really is a dearth of skills out there in the market. So they've got to get it from somewhere. And I think we're going to be in this mixed ecosystem for for quite a while yet. Yeah, I totally agree. And and actually, we're, we're actually in the middle of, of some really interesting research around this generational three sourcing construct. And so we've been interviewing IT and, um, and sourcing leaders, and it's exactly what you just described. So, you know, a large scale movement to many of the hyperscale cloud providers um, and, you know, a, a large movement towards more of a product aligned mentality of building digital products as companies realize how important technology is to their overall strategy. But at the same time, there's still a lot of legacy and it will be around for decades. And that still needs to be sustained. It doesn't need to move at the same speed, but it still needs to move. Yeah. And so using um, providers to help bridge that gap. And that's really where I see the differentiator will be for the MSPs is who can, you know, clearly they can do the sustained work. They've been doing that for 20 years. Yeah. Do they have the talent and skills and can they change their, for example, their go to market and their sales processes to adjust to a world where companies need to be more agile and really are looking for more of a kind of supplemental talent potentially to help them build products on yeah. site. Those that can do both of those, I think are going to be sets for success. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And the the type of, of providers, you know, suppliers, providers that we've been we've been tracking over this last seventeen years, you must have seen some significant change in the in the names of the companies that we track. And I know we we track the the sort of traditional providers, the the building providers, and the breakthrough providers. I think we call them, but um, you'll you'll remind me. But the the names of the companies on the lists of companies that we look at have, are changing very very quickly now right the 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 entire market is becoming more fragmented clients are becoming um more interested in working with specialists alongside traditional providers as much more of a mixed mixed mode environment out, out out there so what do you have you seen a real change in the type of service providers that we see as that we track as part of the index absolutely there's been a a huge amount of of, of churn in the 
um, and the number of uh, providers that we track and also their participation in our various um, leaderboards. I think, um, you know, just first of all, just M&A activity is everywhere. So a lot of the, the big managed service providers um, a couple of years ago, you may recall, were doing a lot of acquisitions around design firms, yeah. um, understanding that they needed to get better at um, sort of that front end UX, UI, helping to build amazing customer experiences, because that's clearly not in the sweet spot traditionally of, of many of the traditional providers. Yeah. And now what we see happening is um, movement towards um, kind of product, you know, acquiring product engineering type companies so that, you know, companies that can um, get down to the silicon level and, and actually are building, you know, physically connected um physical connected products um, as, as that um, uh, movement towards more of a um, an IOT connected environment, whatever, whatever industry you're in is going to be more critical. So there's a lot of M&A activity happening there. But at the same time, there's an explosion of innovation on the as a service provider side. But what's interesting there is that, um, you know, most of the, the big hyperscale providers are getting getting bigger. And so it's actually kind of like the as a service market is almost consolidating, whereas the managed services side is almost sort of fragmenting. And uh, they're playing off each other and various alliances are being built. I think one of the things that we're going to see a lot of is this frenemy model. So at some point, uh, providers are going to be uh, going to market with a as a service provider, but at the same time might be competing with them in another part of, of a company. And so that's really that interesting dynamic of many of these traditional walls that we've gotten used to in industries are breaking down as we see retail companies becoming healthcare companies. And um, it, so that means then the ecosystem is changing just as much. Yeah, absolutely. Now we're, we're seeing this now, your clients asking for the providers they work with to work together and to collaborate and to, you know, they, they're wanting to buy things in one contract, but with multiple providers and the providers are just saying, well, that isn't, that isn't the way, the way we work. And they're having to really rethink the way they go to market to meet the demands that the clients asking for. So re really interesting times. One of the observations I had, or maybe predictions, which I've been wrong about, is you know as the digital, the world of digital transformation is everywhere, and there is you know no other business than, than digital right now. And then alongside that, you've got this move to agile and DevOps and product product um, centric teams moving to minimal viable products. And there's all this flexibility in the market for this different way of working. I imagine that would lead to a shrinking of the market in many ways, because I thought, you know, agile working requires teams to be closer to their, their, their own customers. It would change the offshoring mix and it would lead to a reduction in outsourcing. But funny enough, that's not what we've seen at all, right? We see the market increasing in size and being fueled by digital for demand for digital transformation and a lot of that being in agile and DevOps type um, projects. So um, that was something of a surprise to me. I presumably wasn't a surprise to you. It, it was, what's your view on, on that? Yeah, that's, you're exactly right. And that's why, you know, we continue to think and, and as you look at our forecast, you know, the market is getting bigger. Yeah. And it's getting bigger because the addressable market is getting bigger. If you think about um, in the past and sort of generation one and generation two, IT was more of a back office support function and the cost needed to be maintained and contained. Yeah. Now, technology is the differentiator. Just got off an interview with a, with a, a major media company and um, you know how they now see not only content, but also technology is mission critical for their future success. Yeah. So therefore, the addressable market of technology spend is increasing significantly because it's no, no longer locked in, uh, inside of IT. Now every business unit is producing products and platforms, um, uh, doing more advanced analytics so that that addressable market, you know, we think is increasing and that's why um, you know, we saw a 10% increase uh, first half of this year over first half of last year of the combined market. Um, if you look at the as a service growth in, over the same 20, same period, that's 23% from this the first half of, of 19 to the first half of, of 18. So that market is absolutely exploding. Yeah. Managed services, um, not to the same degree, but it's still growing as well. If you look at the uh, total number of 
uh, awards that have been signed. The la eight of the nine last quarters have, have exceeded 400 awards per quarter. Yeah. Six of the nine last six of the nine last quarters um, have been over 6.5 billion, at least in the Americas. We think the same will happen in Europe, in in Australia. Americas tends to be a little bit of a bellwether for what's going to come later. So um, that market, the combined market, absolutely is expanding, yeah. and that's the reason you see that reflected in our forecast. Yeah, absolutely. Every business is effectively a digital or a tech technology related business. Right. So you have a larger but more fragmented um, playing field. It's yeah, very very interesting. We did some um, some sort of anecdotal res research recently. A, a colleague and I here in in the UK and asked the clients we worked. With, well, we had a look first of all at what we thought they were buying from us. Then we said to them, "What, you know, why did you use ISG, and what were the areas you were really interested in it?" And it, interestingly, there were some commonality around five specific areas. So, none of them had the words digital in them, which I'll come on to in a second. But um, the five were: they asked us about cloud and how they can move to public, private, hybrid models. What the cost base. Um, should be, what their TCO should be, what the business case should be, which service providers they should work with. So we had a commonality around cloud. We then had a commonality around applications. Which applications should I continue to, to use? Which should I mothball? Which will work in the cloud? You know, which should, should I use as, um, as, as a service? Um, and how should I achieve rationalization and simplification? And again, which providers should I work with and, and how much should I spend? And we, we see a lot of demand for that. The third area was around networks. You know, how can I best use my network technology? Should I be moving to software to find networks or what's my 5G strategy? Um, should I still be investing in MPLS or whatever? And again, what are the commercial models, the service providers? You know, you see a theme there, obviously, with the type of work we do. And then there was a... Um, a group around uh, business operations and how can I work most efficiently using technology, be that robotic process automation, be that BPM, be that cognitive or bits of AI or intelligent OCR, but what technologies should I use to improve supply chain, finance, HR, procurement, and those business functions. And then there was a fifth area around the future of work. What does the future operating model look like? You know, what from a physical location perspective to global business services, to shared services, to outsourcing in the future, what should my operating model be like for all my people, process and technologies? And we put all of those five together. And when I was looking at it, I was thinking, they're not, they, they haven't asked us about digital. But when you take a step back, you say, well, actually, all of those five things enable digital transformation, right? They are the building blocks of digital transformation. You can't work in a... Um, an analog way with those technologies, you you need to have a strategy in place for those five building blocks to be able to deliver digital transformation. They're all at the heart of digital, and I think that's sort of why the outsourcing industry is still is still growing because they're all the 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 providers that we are working with are seeing growth in transforming those five areas to enable the, their clients to achieve digital transformation. Yeah, absolutely, and and those are great. The five uh, fantastic areas, and that's part of the the challenge is with digital is that everything is changing at once. Yeah, and it's not it's it's there's not just one or two things. It's everything's changing, and how to synchronize all of that change together mm -hmm. into something that ultimately will. Um, create business value. We talked about that. This is no longer about the technology itself. Of course, that's incredibly interesting and critical and none of this works without it. But ultimately, it's about the transformation of the organization, the underlying operating model to be able to um, compete at a speed that up to this point, nobody has ever competed at. Yeah. And that's, that's a huge change for so many organizations that have so much legacy in terms of process and technology. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot to change. But the cool thing is um, we do see organizations successfully making these changes. Now, is it everything all at once? Absolutely not. But m yeah. there are um, uh, many cases of these really, you know, these long term visions of what they will be as a digital business, but understanding that they have to chunk those up into smaller sprints to use more yeah. of an agile approach. Yeah. Um, but how to synchronize all of that together, and that's why you know I'm a big believer in the operating model, like really defining people, process, technology, how will we work in the future, I think is absolutely critical, and that's really something that companies need to get right, in my opinion, yeah. you know, early on. 
Yeah, I think that orchestration of of that that change is so, is so important in large organizations. And and I always talk about the organizations have to think for the immediate short term, the next couple of years, you know, sort of now forward, what should we do? But they also need to try and put a lens on, you know, what's going to happen the next decade or beyond that sort of future back model. And that's much harder. It's much more fun, but it's much harder to think, you know, what are the changes that are going to go on in my, my industry? So um, I wanted to change tact slightly. And in the last sort of um, few minutes that we've got, I think we've probably got a little bit, um, six or seven minutes left. I, I always ask my guests on the podcast five questions, and I know I haven't prepped you for this, so I'm going to see how 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 well you do. But just give me your your immediate answer that comes to mind, because we don't have a lot of time. But which the first question is, which technology has had the most impact on your career to date? Do you think, and and why? Yeah, I would have to say, Barry, um, I. The first thing that pops out of my head is, is uh, it would be blogging or you know web publishing. So I love to I love to write, and I solve problems by writing. And I started a blog about 2009, yeah. and um, that was actually probably pretty late <laughs> for blogging. But um, I think that that's um, if I think back over the past you know kind of 10, 15 years, being able to write and publish online. In, yeah. the, in and of itself is really cool, uh, and that's made a big difference for me personally as well. Yeah, I absolutely know. I t totally agree that suddenly you get your own personal opinions, and you can get it out there to the to the world, which you could never do previously. Right? I think that's had a huge impact on on the way that we communicate. And now, of course, with vlogging, you know, which didn't exist in those days, but is now. You know, now probably I think in the Oxford English Dictionary is a is a thing. I mean, the world is just, we just communicate in completely different ways. Do you, is there a technology that springs to mind that promised most, and you thought, "Wow, this is going to be game changing," and then has has delivered very little? There's quite a few technologies out there. You thought, "Wow, this is going to be going to be huge," and they, you know, it could be any anything from gadgets which enable you to travel or communicate or whatever um to that that really never came to to anything some might argue that blockchain might be in that in that category many others wouldn't and they would say it's going to be revolutionary but are there any technologies that spring to mind that you thought wow this is going to be a game changer and then it turned into a damp squib um you know i don't know if it's a if it's promised much yet but i guess one of the things i was thinking about this the other day when i was uh, at the grocery store and in the states we have humongous grocery stores. I mean, they're they're they're. Yeah. I'm even amazed at how big they are. Um, <laughs> we have made these massive improvements in outdoor mapping, um, and you know we can't imagine not having Google Maps or Apple Maps, um, ways as we travel on the on the highway. Yeah. I guess I'm I'm not surprised by the lack of progress in indoor mapping, because of the complications. I know that it's hard to do. I guess I'm kind of disappointed that we haven't made more progress on being able to identify where you are and where things are inside of places. I yeah. think that's disappointing, but I understand why it's so hard, but I still am disappointed when I go into the hardware store and can't find what I need. Yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? I remember retailers I work with trying to get that right, that sort of internal you know, zonal mapping for years ago and never really being able to do it. I think that's absolutely a very good point. You still don't. You still have to look at the signs when you walk into a retail store, don't you, to to find out where to buy something. Um, and in, interesting. I don't know whether you have this in the U.S. It's a global thing, or whether it's just in Europe. But I was reading about this thing called Three Words the other day for um, for outdoor mapping. Have you ever heard of that before? Where there are three specific words which are able to pinpoint within a couple of meters or, or feet anywhere um, externally outside of buildings, I think, but you know anywhere on the um, on the planet, I think. Um, have you come across that yet? I have not. It's really interesting. It's called three. I think it's just called three words, and everywhere you live, it's like a like a um, a postcode or a zip code or or whatever. But it's just a, a new way of um, tracking exactly where you are, even if you're in a forest or in, you're in the mountains or wherever, within a certain you know radius, there are three specific words using an app um, which pinpoint exactly where you are. I thought it was a really clever new technology, which I know the UK police have started to use. Anyway, in interesting. Um, third question I have, uh, third question of five. So 
I'm a real gadget um, freak. I, I like to buy the latest gadgets as soon as they come out. And then generally they then gather dust in my in my man drawer at home. But do you are you a gadget guy? Do you have any specific gadget that you use? You know, technology gadget, I mean, that has made a, a difference to your life? I'm not a huge gadget person. I'm, I'm a, I love technology, um, but I'm not a huge gadget person. But if I, I think that there, there, there is one, um, I don't know if you've ever used this or not, but on, so I'm learning Spanish and I use Google Translate a lot. Uh, although my Spanish teacher would tell me stop translating. Uh, <laughs> but so I think we've all gotten accustomed to the idea of a translation app. That's, you know, yeah. uh, that doesn't surprise us anymore, but yeah. with Google, uh, translate on the app at least you can use the camera and hold it up to something that's written in a different language mm -hmm. and using machine vision and obviously natural language processing it translates it in real time on your phone and you're still seeing the picture of the object but yeah. translated in your native language in the same font same color and mm -hmm. I look at that and I still think that is magic and I know I know behind the scenes it's just math yeah. And I show that to people sometimes and I'll show it to my kids and they'll say, yeah, that, that's neat. But it's literally magic. And it's just that to me still amazes me. So that I would say that's something that not that I use it that much. I actually yeah. was just in London and Paris and use it a couple times in Paris. But I think yeah. that that's really astounding technology. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, that's yeah. going to become so commonplace here shortly. Yeah, well, I, I totally agree with you. I know exactly what you mean. And I still think it's magic. Um, so I, I'm still inspired by that type of stuff. So um, penultimate question for you. If you look to the next 10 years, which, which technology do you think is going to have the biggest impact on, on business? So is it going to be AI or machine learning or blockchain or, or something else? Is there a technology that you think is going to have a massive impact over the next decade? Yeah, so I, I think it's the machine learning um... If you think about just this approach that we're taking, which is the idea that you should just be able to give data to a computer and let it learn on its own, it's such a profound idea. And of course, this has been around for a while and is kind of one of the most kind of promising approaches to AI. I think we're just just at the tip of the iceberg of what that's going to mean to enterprises, but to uh, us personally and, and the world, frankly, because I don't think we sometimes we forget about how much ML and these algorithms are embedded in our life already. I mean, if you think about, you know, they are influencing, you know, what you buy, what songs you listen to, if you get yeah. credit, if you get a job, um, yeah, they're going to be used in law enforcement and, and it's becoming sort of an underpinning technology in everything that we do, yeah. but it's invisible. And I think we're just at the tip of the iceberg. Now that said, in terms of enterprise use cases, I think there's still a long ways to go because companies need to understand their data and they need to have good, clean, well-labeled data in order to build you know, acceptable, uh, even AI, ML proof of concept. And that's where I think a lot of companies are gonna stumble is in the quality of their data. Yeah. And, and But I still think it's going to have an absolutely profound imp impact. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Funnily enough, I watched the um, uh, a documentary called The Great Hack last night. I think it's called The Great Hack, which was all around the Cambridge Analytica story and the impact that Cambridge Analytica's use of data had on the Trump election and on, and on Brexit. It's, if you've not seen that documentary, it's, it's mind-blowing. It's um, fan fantastic. Thoroughly recommended. Um, so my final question, is there anyone who's um, from a professional perspective who's had a, an impact uh, on your life from a, tech, uh, a technology angle, Who, your technology hero. As an example, um, I worked at GE for a, a number of years at the beginning of my career and um, was fortunate enough to, um, to, to work under a long, long, long way under um, Jack Welsh, who was chief exec at the time, and he had a profound impact on me and my career. And I reuse his quotes all the time in my presentations, as you've probably seen. So he's certainly a tech hero of mine. Is there someone who's had a, um, an impact, a, a positive impact, I'm assuming, on, on your life from a technology perspective? Yeah, I, I, so I've been reading a lot about um, Alan Turing and mm. just absolutely a giant in terms of his intellect. Um, 
he was also i'm a runner and i i literally did not know this he was a world-class marathoner which i, I think is that either uh, literally i think had 11 seconds left uh 11 seconds behind the guy that ended up winning the silver medal at the olympics that year so mm-hmm. um i mean this was after uh world war ii yeah. So just an absolute giant, you know, his, his, it goes back to what we just talked about. You know, he used a machine to beat another machine. Yeah. And so, and then obviously his personal story is, is um, heartbreaking, but I think, you know, if you look at what um, is happening now with his name now on a, on a note, I don't know what, I think it's the 50, I, I'm not sure exactly what it is, what, what note he's going to be on, but um, he's a, 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 an absolutely fascinating, I think, an absolute giant that is now, just now, being appreciated. Absolutely. Oh, I think that's a great answer. Fantastic. Thank you very much in, indeed. Really interesting um, chatting to you. Some really fascinating facts about the changing nature of the outsourcing industry, which is all data and fact-based from the 17 years and 67 um, quarters. So I really enjoyed that conversation and some great answers to our questions, which we will review all of our guests' questions at the end of uh, end of a year in a in a podcast episode in uh, December. So a huge thank you, Stanton. Really appreciate you, um, you you joining me, and I look forward to speaking to you again very shortly. Thanks, Barry.